Billions of people use the internet every day. But the internet and the companies which dominate it are using them too. We live in an online world. There are 8.5 billion searches on Google daily, while for many, it seems that smartphones have become extensions of our very selves. Many of the services we use every day on our phones and laptops are free, but we pay in another way, with our personal information. The big move was not only to invade personal experience, to turn it into data, but then to claim those data as the private property of the corporation. Wow. Monetizing data catapulted companies like Google from being unprofitable startups to multi-billion dollar empires in the space of a few years. But how our data is being used by these companies is now a point of intense debate. Because this is so new, we have sort of an awful lot of panic. Um, you know, it reminds me a lot of, you know, with the days when, you know, Elvis Presley was a threat to democracy and, you know, punk was a threat to democracy and bicycles were going to make young women unfertile. Surveillance, capitalism or democracy. We can have one or we can have the other. We cannot have both. I call it a death match between these two global institutional orders. Will the status quo hold amid increasing legal pressure? And I think we will gradually move to a system where we don't take these companies as like heroes and, you know, Zuckerberg or some, some Google executive as like the new messiahs, uh, but we'll realize they're just a company, they do make mistakes as well, they need proper regulation and we need to deal with it. It's coming up on this episode of Business Beyond. The word surveillance has negative connotations. It implies being watched or spied upon, usually without knowledge or consent. And it's a word that's increasingly linked to companies like Google and Meta through the phrase surveillance capitalism. The phrase was coined by the author Shoshana Zuboff in her book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. She believes this so-called surveillance capitalism represents a new economic model which claims human experience and personal information as a raw material to be exploited for commercial purposes. And she says it all started here at Google in the late 1990s and early 2000s. <laughs> CEO of Google. At the beginning of the, uh, of the dot-com era, some young men sat around the table trying to figure out how they were going to make money at Google, how to make money out of search. It seemed like everything that could be commodified already had been commodified. And so there was a lot of head scratching going on until Larry Page and his cohort, Larry Page being the founder of Google, one of the founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, he came up with the breakthrough. And the breakthrough was the next virgin forest, ready for commodification, was human experience itself. She says Google developed increasingly sophisticated ways to use data they had gotten from internet searches to make predictions about people's future online behavior. They used the data to analyze it to predict human behavior. And that's what they sell. And their breakthrough prediction was the click-through rate that launched online targeted advertising. We associate Google, also known by its parent company name Alphabet, with search above all else. But Google is known for many other services, such as Google Maps, Gmail, and other companies it owns, such as YouTube, self-driving branch Waymo, and the fitness electronic system Fitbit. Google has also been active over the years, making acquisitions from the likes of YouTube to hundreds of other companies, big and small, in a variety of fields. Despite this diversification of service, the vast majority of Google's huge revenues, more than $257 billion in 2021, come from advertising more than 80%. Google did not respond to our request for an interview. However, its privacy policy does say that it uses data to improve its overall service and to customize the user experience. Let's say you search for mountain biking. We use what you searched for, other searches you've made, your location, and what other people did when they searched for mountain biking to find you the results you're looking for. Mountain biking trails near you. What Google outlines there is a simplified explanation of how it uses data to optimize search results. But here's where the real money comes from. Depending on your settings, 
We may also use your info to show you personalized ads. So next time you're on YouTube, you might see an ad for biking gear. Google says it doesn't share anything with advertisers which personally identifies people. So your personal information is safe with us. But critics like Zuboff say our personal information is anything but safe with Google and that they have built and nurtured a system as dangerous as it is lucrative. So the really strange thing about this is while it's called personalization, that is a very um, cruel euphemism for the fact that they want to be able to identify us, but not to help us. They want to take our data from us, but not to use it to improve our lives in any substantive way. What they simply want is to be able to identify our lives in order to extract the data, in order to create predictions, in order to sell, in order to generate revenues, in order to generate profit. That's the world that we live in. Not everyone agrees with the phrase surveillance capitalism. I can understand that that might be a good way to try and sell a book. I can understand that that's a lucrative way to get speaking engagements. I can understand that it's eye-catching, it's attention-grabbing, it sounds very scary. But it's very difficult to, to, to think of a way that that connects to any kind of tangible reality. Tech analyst Benedict Evans takes particular issue with the word surveillance. I find surveillance actually kind of offensive as a term to use. Because to me, this sort of expropriates the suffering of people who lived in actual surveillance states. You know, people who actually lived in East Germany, you know, if the government is interested in you, they have 15 people following you around and they have microphones in your home and they're, you know, one of your friends is informing on you. That's what surveillance means. Surveillance is not you read a car magazine and you looked at 10 car ads, so therefore we'll show you a car ad. There is an argument that the data economy is the price we pay for the huge leaps in innovation and technological progress of the last two decades. There was a time when the chemical industry, which produced magical things we'd never seen before, was allowed to just dump its, its excess pollution into our common waters and into our rivers. And it took a long time before it was forced to face up to its responsibilities. We're at the same stage now. In fact, I think right now we're in the middle of Dieselgate for tech. Everyone likes cars. They, they like how they purr. They really like petrol cars. <laughs> and yet there is a moment of responsibility where you must acknowledge that what we have is not sustainable. Mass media does cause problems, you know, but you kind of have to step back and think, yes, but is it a really a terrible thing that we can have a one hour video call from New York to Germany for free? Do we want to get rid of that, really? Do we want to, do, you know, this call would have cost like $200 in 1980. Do we think that would have been better? We've already touched on the complex world of online targeted advertising, but let's look a little deeper now. The Irish Council for Civil Liberties is a non-profit organisation which focuses much of its work on privacy violations. Last year, it released a much publicised report on a complex and critical component of the online targeted advertising industry. When you load a web page, there are rectangles on the web page that will contain ads. And often you'll notice there's a split second where the material you're trying to read gets bounced down the page because the ad has just been dropped in. What's happening there is that there's an auction for your attention. This auction is known as real-time bidding. Known commonly as RTB, real-time bidding is one of the most effective and controversial forms of online advertising. The entirely automated process is an auction where you, the user, is being bid over. It all happens in the milliseconds between you clicking a link and that website opening. After the user clicks a certain website, large volumes of their personal data and browsing history is shared with prospective advertisers. Advertisers can then see how valuable it will be for that user to see their ad. Bids are placed by advertisers with the highest and most relevant bid winning. That ad is then placed on the website the user has just clicked. Now what that means is that every time you visit a commercial web page, nearly every single rectangle is sending information about what you're reading and where you are in the real world out to a very, very large number of companies, and we don't know what they do with the data. 
In the 2022 report, the Irish Council for Civil Liberties described RTB as one of the biggest data breaches in history. It says that on average, a person in the US has their online activity and location exposed 747 times a day by the RTB industry alone. In Europe, it's 376 times a day. It's said that every year, RTB broadcasts user info about people in the US and Europe 178 trillion times. The industry was worth around $117 billion in 2021 alone. But all advertising is targeted in one way or another, and there's the argument that in theory, that's not a bad thing. Procter & Gamble want to show ads for nappies to people who have babies and not show them to people who don't. And they would kind of like to know which ads work and which ads don't. They don't care what your baby's name is. At all. They don't care if your baby's circumcised. They don't want to know anything about you. They just want to show nappy ads to people who have babies and not show them to people who don't. And I think we can get very kind of bound up on the idea that there's a sort of Stasi-like personal file on every individual and somebody could go and look at it and read, out you, read, read about you. No, um, somebody went to Facebook and said, I want to show ads to nappies to 10,000 people in um, Frankfurt who've got babies. But critics say targeted advertising has become about profit maximization for Google and Meta and uses private data in a way which is unnecessary. In order to have high quality contextual advertising that is useful to everyone and makes everybody money, we literally don't need what we built. But we built it. The Austrian lawyer and privacy activist Max Schrems has launched several legal campaigns against Facebook over the years for its privacy rights violations. If you buy a product and you know you really need the address to deliver the product, fair enough, you need the address. Um, but that doesn't mean you can sell it to 10 other people and you can track me and try to kind of put a profile around me and so on. And I think what's uh, really interesting is the profit margins. Like no one doubts that they should make a profit, um, but a lot of that profit can be done without um, tracking every little bit of users. It's really about profit maximization. And I think that is where it is surveillance capitalism narrative kind of works quite well to say it's really a system where it's like how can I even push more money out of the last bit of information. He says it is important to make a distinction between ads linked to a user's direct searches on Google and those of companies which are reliant on bundling a user's personal information together to build a profile. Google is really good at advertising because they right now have you right there when you want something. If you put in red shoes you actually want to buy red shoes in that moment and you can put an advertisement there. But they don't need to know who you are in that situation. And I think that is a type of advertisement, for example, that usually is very effective, but not overly privacy invasive. There's another huge player in the global advertising business that hasn't had the luxury of its own search engine to help build its data mountain. Meta Platforms controls Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp, some of the biggest social networks and messaging platforms in the world. Facebook has found itself mired in multiple data privacy controversies over the years. One of the biggest, Cambridge Analytica. That scandal revealed that a political consultancy called Cambridge Analytica gained access to the private data of more than 80 million Facebook users and used that data to target them with political ads in advance of the 2016 Brexit referendum and the US presidential election that same year. It led to Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg being hauled before US Congress in a now infamous appearance. I started Facebook, I run it, and I'm responsible for what happens here. Mr. Zuckerberg, would you be comfortable sharing with us the name of the hotel you stayed in last night? Um, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Max Schrems was on a semester abroad studying law in California when a Facebook lawyer spoke to his class. Schrems was surprised by how little the lawyer seemed to know about European privacy law. And so Schrems asked Facebook to show him all the data they had on him. So for example, when I first got my data from Facebook, I was able to demonstrate that my deleted data was still there, that they, for example, tried to figure out my geolocation without me ever sharing any location information with them. And that is the stuff that is very hard to find out, especially, um, for example, users do have a right to ask for um, a copy of their data. But right now, most of these large companies just don't comply with that. And the regulators also don't go into their servers and actually check what's, what's in the background. Like Google, Facebook makes the vast majority of its revenues from advertising. 
Using data to tap into the targeted advertising goldmine is a key reason it has outlasted so many other social media platforms. For a long time, Facebook needed all that information because they were not with you in the search situation, in a situation where you actually wanted something. So they had to kind of figure out other ways that you wanted something and needed more data. Because Meta owns both WhatsApp and Instagram, the question often arises, can the company take data from those platforms and use them for targeted ads on Facebook. The German Competition Authority has taken a case against Meta and said it is not lawful for you to combine data between your subsidiaries, WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, and of course, their virtual reality subsidiary, Oculus. Now that case has gone all the way up to Luxembourg, to Europe's highest court, and we're waiting to see what the answers are. But this issue about the combination of data within Facebook's or Meta's properties, including WhatsApp, that's a live issue, that's a real thing. For many years, WhatsApp was not end-to-end -end encrypted, but has been since 2016. Encryption is a form of data scrambling which prevents unauthorized parties accessing the information. But that doesn't mean that what we do on WhatsApp can't be used as data. It may even provide a clue into one of the great mysteries of the smartphone age. Are they listening to us? WhatsApp is actually quite a good example because it used to be you paid one euro a year and were let alone. Now, that model, Facebook simply took away. They just said, you're not going to pay the one euro, but um, we're going to get your metadata. And metadata is something no one really understands in the first time around. But it basically says the content of your communication is encrypted fine, but we're going to use who writes to whom at what time and how often. And that allows you to build this social network. Metadata may show that two people chat a lot in the evening or on weekends. The timing and intensity of their communication may lead Meta to make very accurate predictions on their relationship. And a good example is where people oftentimes have this feeling of, oh, you know, this advertisement listened to me because I chatted with my friend about this topic and now suddenly I see advertisement. A typical way how that's really done is they know that your friend was really looking on this one topic all over the place for the last two weeks then they know there was a lot of communication, so they just give the advertisement to you as well, assuming that probably your friend was chatting about the one thing he's obsessed about for last week. Um, and that is quite interesting because people think they're listened or spied on their communication. Um, but these big data analytics and the metadata that you can get, for example, from WhatsApp, allows very accurate and kind of quite creepy advertisement um, without even going that far. We asked Meta for an interview. They declined but they did give us this statement. Protecting the privacy and security of people's data is fundamental to how our business works. That's why we've invested heavily in tools like Privacy Checkup and Ads Preferences that provide more transparency and controls for people to understand and manage their privacy settings. We're committed to respecting our users' privacy and we welcome engagement with regulators, which helps us to do this. Companies like Google and Meta and other tech giants such as Apple, Amazon and Microsoft have changed their data privacy practices over the years in the wake of scandals and political pressure. However, today they are facing arguably more legal scrutiny than ever before for how they handle our personal data. The European Union is driving the regulatory crackdown. Its signature legislation on privacy was implemented in 2018. That's the General Data Protection Regulation, known commonly as GDPR. So the GDPR does two things. It puts a number of obligations on the people that want to use your information and it gives a number of rights to yourself vis-à-vis -vis the persons who are using your data. The legislation has had implications for the way firms and organisations across Europe handle personal data, but has it impacted the lucrative business of online targeted ads? So, uh, while the GDPR does not outright ban any of the practices, it does regulate them and it puts uh, high sanctions on them, which was not the case in the old regime. So it has forced the big tech, co big tech companies to take those rules into account and it has uh, brought them under uh, a high level of regulatory scrutiny. They are very much uh, uh, being watched for what they, what they do. Earlier we discussed real-time bidding, the online auction for our attention. GDPR now requires that companies and websites must ask us for explicit permission before they can take the kind of data 
this process requires. It has resulted in something that is much more familiar to all of us, is the famous cookie consent boxes you see popping up on many uh, websites. And the requirement there is, of course, to obtain a consent from the individual before you can put a cookie uh, on his uh, device, which is often the first step to collecting his data. That's often how it works technically. And it's not enough for companies to assume if you keep browsing, you're giving consent. Max Schrem says it's wrong that ordinary citizens are expected to understand the extremely complex ways in which their data is being used. Not even if you work for Google, you probably fully understand how everything works, everything that Google does work because you're just working on this one little piece here. Um, and that is quite interesting that we just overload the, the consumer and think that that's a, a fair way of, of dealing with it, which, I mean, as an asterisk, the law actually doesn't allow that, but that's at least the narrative of what, what companies put forward there. Penalties for data privacy breaches have gotten more severe since GDPR came in. Fines in the 100 million euros range have become common. In January this year, Meta was fined nearly 400 million euros for forcing users to accept targeted ads. But privacy campaigners say the legislation is still not being properly enforced. What we've seen is almost no material enforcement. The GDPR still is not yet real. And we've, we've just had a situation where uh, we were able to manage <laughs> We, we managed to prevail on the European Commission to start monitoring all large-scale cases across Europe. And the reason we had to do that was because the national enforcers and the lander enforcers were not producing fast enough. And when decisions emerged, those decisions, particularly from Ireland and Luxembourg, did not solve the problem of big tech. The Commission for a long time had, about, had kind of the story of the GDPR as a success story, don't rain on the parade, just say it's great and move on. Um, and I think we have to be honest, like as a legislative proposal, it's actually quite kind of top notch in the world. It's probably not the best where have a hundred years down the road probably to make it better, uh, but it's quite a significant like level and a lot of other countries copy it. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's perfect and that doesn't mean that the enforcement works well. We've looked at some of the complex ways in which our data is used and the increasing legal challenges that system is facing. But what's ultimately at stake here? Some say democracy itself. In my country, in the United States, the head of our federal uh, drug uh, administration told the world in th this year, in the year 2022, that the number one, the primary cause of death in America in 2022 is disinformation. Disinformation. False information intended to mislead. Many believe its rising power is directly tied to the targeted advertising models which support the modern internet. It's free to use, free to post, um, and that it is underwritten and supported by the advertising infrastructure of programmatic advertising, which um, is, is what we just discussed. Um, because it's free uh, and there's so there's literally no cost to using it from the point of view of a consumer um, and because every consumer can be a producer um, then malicious producers uh, spring up. Disinformation is a direct consequence of the economic mechanisms of surveillance capitalism and that it in, in itself has become murderous the primary source of death in American society. So this is something that is, it's it's literally so brazen and outrageous, so counter to human society, so counter to democratic aspirations. Meta, through Facebook and WhatsApp, has been caught up in multiple scandals over disinformation. Most recently, the whistleblower and former Facebook employee Francis Haugen gave damaging testimony to US Congress about the way Meta deals with hate speech and disinformation. But there is plenty of disagreement over who is ultimately responsible for the spread of disinformation. It's very easy to talk about um, misinformation and say, well, Facebook should take this down. Um, what does that mean? You know, if I send you a text message that says vaccines cause cancer, we don't expect Deutsche Telekom to intercept that test message 
text, text message and stop you from getting it. If I make you a phone, if I were on the phone and I say, I think vaccines cause cancer, we don't expect the phone company to pick that conversation up and cut it off. There is also the argument that so-called threats to democracy do not always materialize as such. There's a wonderful quote from Douglas Adams who said that you know, anything that existed before you were 20 or 10 is just the way the world has always been. And anything created when you were a teenager in your 20s is amazing and wonderful and exciting and you can have a career in it. And anything created after you're about 30 is a threat to democracy. We've come to the end of our look into the myriad ways in which our personal data drives the digital economy. And it seems we've arrived at a fork in the road. A big question looms. Where do we go from here? We have strong and clear law and we're now in front of courts in multiple jurisdictions. I don't think that the current situation inside tech will really exist for much longer. This is why I think we're at this Dieselgate moment. This is the last chapter, but it has taken far, far too long to get here. And although the legislator did its job, we have the right law, the enforcers have completely failed. I think it's really interesting to compare the internet with cars. Like here is this sort of transformative technology that changes how we live, that changes how society works, that changes how city work, cities work. And it comes with a bunch of problems. That's complicated. Um, most of the questions that come up in technology, again, are complicated. And they're not complicated because they're tech, they're complicated because they're policy. You know, tech policy isn't, isn't any easier or any simpler than education policy or energy policy, policy or transport policy. You know, it's all complicated. Policy is complicated. Shoshana Zuboff still believes in what she calls our democratic digital future, despite the dystopian imagery of much of her work. We need lawmakers to join together to chart the legislative path to create the scaffolding so that we can do this for the sake of every democratic society and every society struggling to become a democracy. Because without that, we will cede the death match to these forces of surveillance and control that have a very different ambition for our future, one that involves the substitution of computational governance, where they rule for democratic governance, where the people rule. That's all from this edition of Business Beyond. If you want to see more from us, check out our playlist. A good place to start would be our recent video on how the war in Ukraine has transformed the global economy. Thank you for watching, and until the next time, take care.